Welcome to Halting Towards I Am, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Broom, and today we're going to go back in time and pick up some threads that we started weaving a few weeks ago. First of all, we wanted to go back and talk a little bit more about Uparts. We kind of mentioned at the beginning of the last episode what Uparts are. They're out-of-place artifacts, but we didn't really dig into some examples or anything like that. So, Greg, did you want to walk us through a little bit more about those? Well, I'll mention a couple, and you're welcome to to fill in anything you like along the way. And and this is something we'll probably come back to next week. It's a little sprinkling too much as an overdose. Down through the last couple centuries, people keep turning up things that shouldn't really be there, Nails or screws embedded in quartz, uh, gold chains uh, that fall out of coal bins with both ends still embedded in the coal. Mm -hmm. Devices or seeming parts of devices that are buried deep and with no explanation. And then occasionally just something that's in a tomb or some such place or comes up an archaeological dig that at first glance at least looks like it's not part of the original culture or suggest that maybe we completely misunderstand the original culture. The problem with all these is, of course, interpretation. We weren't there when the thing was buried. We don't quite know how it got there. And then secondly, do we believe everybody who reports something in a newspaper that's 100 years old? Well, we believe, we believe a lot of things that appear in the newspaper today without questioning further, but we need to perhaps <laughs> be a little more serious than that. So Unless I'll, it comes from the <clears throat> Babylon Bee. Yeah, Actually, that's abs- the only source that I trust. That's the only source we believe about anything. I'll point out um, one or two that are pretty safe because, well, one of them because they're um, they're recognized. In 1900, sponge divers off the coast of Greece, uh, off the island of Antikythera, found a shipwreck on the bottom, and from it recovered the remains of some kind of a geared mechanism. And at first, it wasn't obvious what it might be, because the gears were pretty well, as you can imagine, rusted together. But with appropriate technology and such, people were able to figure out what those gears were, recreate them, and show how they would fit together. And it turned out that this device, which um, uh, dates from the first century before Christ, is some kind of uh, predictor... Technically, it's some kind of analog computer, if you want to talk about mechanical devices being computers, that predicted the rising and setting of the sun and maybe the planets as well. Now, when this was discovered, people didn't believe it because we've come a long way in uh, 100 years or so, 120 years. And things that once upon a time we would have said the ancient world did not have any such thing, it's impossible. We're getting more and more to the point of even Time magazine saying, oh, look at this, nanotechnology in Rome. Uh, which is <laughs> something I sent you. I hope you, you have a copy of it because I don't. Oh, yeah. I can grab it. Yeah. So th- this was an odd thing. What uh, geared mechanisms on a sailing ship 100 years before Christ being used to navigate by showing everybody where the sun, moon, and planets are going to be? That, that, was, that was strange. Another thing, I'll just throw this one out. In 1836... Workers excavating a hill outside of Baghdad turned up uh, an odd little vase. It held a copper cylinder, which in turn enclosed a um, corroded iron rod. The rod projected up out of the vase to an asphalt plug. The corrosion on the iron was the hint. In 1940, uh, a GE engineer built a replica and filled it with copper sulfide solution, and the result was a weak electric current. Not weak, not strong enough to do much of anything, except maybe electroplate jewelry, which accounts for some finds of electroplated jewelry in the ancient world. <laughs> so, again, not a huge thing, and if you think about it, not that huge a discovery, except there was a time where archaeology and anthropology and, and history said that's not possible. The ancients knew nothing of electricity any more than they knew anything of, of geared mechanisms. Do you have that thing about uh, nanotechnology in Rome? Yeah, this is from Ancient Origins. It says, Romans mastered nanotechnology and used it for eye-catching decoration. And there's a little sort of chalice. Looks to have a foot of silver and kind of the rim is also silver. If you, if you shine the light from the front of the glass, it looks jade green. But if you move the light to the back, it's red. 
uh, the light shining through it is red. And that is actually nanotechnology at work. And people have looked at it and said, on the one hand, wow, what are the odds? What a coincidence that they accidentally discovered this without knowing what they were doing. <laughs> and others have said, um, no, this is, uh, this is not something that happens accidentally. Obviously, somehow, some way, they figured this out once upon a time and were making use of it. So, again, technology that shouldn't exist, but it did. And what we are coming up with is that the ancient world had a technology that we don't understand. We look at all this and think primitive, but we're wrong. There was something there. And what we find, and the reason we bring this up now is when we talk about the Great Flood, the Deluge, Noah's Flood, whatever you want to call it, it helps to understand that there was something there that was bigger, grander, greater, grander, more advanced than what followed. Now, Upart's a part. There, there's something that's, well, I guess you could call it a new part. It's just so big. It's called the Pyramid, the Great Pyramid. <laughs> uh, that appeared uh, shortly after the flood, a few hundred years after the flood. And although we can look at it and say, oh, it's no big deal. It's a bunch of stones stacked on one another, uh, although extravagant claims have been made for it. Uh, one one <laughs> yeah. thing one thing is certain. We don't know how to do that. We have no idea how the the Great Pyramid was built. We can talk about slave labor. Well, that doesn't seem to be it, even if, even if we had enough. Uh, some of these pyramids were produced very rapidly. One king produced three during his lifetime. We don't know. Now, you know, again, we get weird people saying magic, levitation, aliens. Well, it's not that. And sometimes technology can be very, very simple. Uh, there used to be a clip online on YouTube of a guy who was building Stonehenge in his backyard. Unfortunately, I don't have the guy's name at the moment. I don't think the clip is still up. But all he was using were, were um, levers and uh, sand in bags and pebbles as pivot points. And he was moving by himself huge blocks of stone. Hmm. Sometimes technology doesn't have to be as complicated as I need my levitation ray. It can be, <laughs> give me a bag of sand and, and uh, one stone and I'll move this thing for you. Give me a lever long enough and I can yeah. move the cosmos. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so we we have this as a background that's important in our understanding and discussion of, of social theory. There was a civilization once that was exceedingly advanced. How advanced? Well, we, we don't know exactly, and probably not safe to take too many guesses. But shortly after the flood, it, that was wiped away the flood, and after the flood, it was reborn in major river valleys across the world. Nile, the Euphrates, the Indus River Valley. The civilization sprang up almost overnight with no antecedents because they remembered something. Someone had handed them manuals of how to build civilizations. So we want to keep that in mind both for this time and for next time as well. So that's, that's one reason I wanted to talk about this, but we can move on now to other things. <laughs> well, before we move forward, we're going to move even further back. <sighs> Um, <laughs> we talked a couple of weeks ago about guilt and self-atonement. Uh, Jacob McPherson was in on that episode, and we got some listener feedback that said, hey, aren't you kind of painting with a broad brush when you talk about, you know, different diets or different books or whatever? And that's true. We don't want to broad brush everyone's motivations in choosing a diet. We don't think that everyone who chooses to cut back on meat or dairy is you know, trying to have works righteousness before God. That's not what we're saying. But we do want to distinguish a couple of things. Um, first, we want to distinguish sometimes the philosophy from the diet, especially with veganism. Uh, there's a difference between going plant-based with what you eat for health reasons and trying to have that be your virtue in life, your, your way of achieving righteousness. I found... Actually, shortly after we recorded that episode, an article from Verily Magazine, which is a women's magazine. I actually wrote for them a little bit last year or so. But they have an article that I thought was so relevant to our conversation that I wanted to bring it in. 
It's called Eating to be Clean, the Growing Awareness for Orthorexia. Orthorexia, like ortho, like orthodontia, like straight teeth, so the right way to do things, and then rexia, like anorexia, an eating disorder. So there's this growing trend of people who throw themselves into diets, not because of strictly the health benefits to them, but because they think that's how they find meaning in their life. And so I wanted to read a couple of quick paragraphs from this article. And this will be in the show notes. I'll place a link and I'll have the links from the Uparts discussion as well in the show notes. So here, in talking about orthorexia, it's important to understand what it's not. It's not vegetarianism, veganism, gluten-free, dairy-free, the keto, paleo, Whole30 diets, or any other system of eating, however particular it may be. Food allergies are real, and much evidence suggests that our healthcare system and the environment would be better off with more vegetarians in the world. The standard American diet, with its apt acronym SAD, S-A-D, is notorious for making people overweight, unhappy, and dead. It's not wrong for people to want to find a better, healthier way to eat. Where a special interest in diet transitions from a hobby or passion into a problem is when it devours the rest of your life, pun intended. Any health-focused diet can become orthorexic with the right combination of perfectionism and obsession. One sign of trouble is if your eating habits become tied to your self-esteem. In our culture, healthy eating is considered virtuous, but an orthorexic mindset takes things further. Finding and following the purest diet becomes a potential path to holiness, so to speak. In his book, Dr. Brotman explains that the self-denial, discipline, and commitment required for an extreme eating lifestyle can make people feel good about themselves. There's a sense of being one of the elite, the few, the proud, the sugar-free. <laughs> and I was just stunned that this article came out the week after we talked about this very phenomenon that what you eat becomes your identity and your way of being right with the world. What the Bible criticizes, of course, is a religious approach to food that says, I will be holier, more right with God, more blessed, if I eat this way. Now, you could survey most Americans and they would not say that's the reason for picking this diet or that diet, because most Americans don't give God a second thought when it comes to their food. But sometimes it's not consciously God we're appealing to. It's our general conscience, general sense of morality. And people do often make food choices, either at the beginning or along the way, as they get used to it, in terms of a morality of food. Eating this sort of food is not only healthy, it is morally better than what you're eating. And we develop the same kind of moralism that appears in religious circles because we need to find something. Does everybody do that? No, of course not. Hardly no. Uh, some people, as you say, do literally have food allergies. And you, you, you know this because when you eat the food, it hurts in some fashion. But then there are the trendier than thou people who simply say, oh, well, they're not eating it. I won't eat it either. And the whole thing snowballs. I remember, I think it was a Jay Leno who, who went about asking people uh, on the street what gluten was. Got interesting reactions to it. It's something they add to your food to poison you. Uh, not, not all <laughs> food choices. It's kind of not. <laughs> <laughs> all food choices are, and all diets are not well informed from a Christian point of view, for instance. Any kind of paleo diet is ridiculous because that was never man's condition. Mm -hmm. So are, are, are we saying that if you want to not eat this because you don't like it, because it doesn't taste good, or because you're allergic to it, or even simply because you found by experience that it'll help you drop a few pounds and that makes you feel better about yourself. Is there anything wrong with that? No, that's, that, that's fine. But it is easy for us to turn anything. In the absence of Jesus' grace, it's, it's easy for us to turn everything into a tool for self-atonement. Self and we have to be bitterly honest with ourselves. I've seen very strong Christians pick up this or that fat. It can be diet. It can be something else. And absolutely insist that real Christians, true Christians, godly Christians, reformed Christians, pick an adjective, do it this way. When in fact, the Bible says no such thing. Uh, so while on the one hand saying, if you're, being, if you're playing it safe or you're enjoying, you're just eating the things you enjoy, that you feel make you healthy, that's great. We're not being critical of that in the least. But we are warning everyone, ourselves included, that we all are prone to fads. 
and we tend to enshrine them as ways to be closer to God, better than other people, holier than thou. And the judgmental factor here is huge. We, we, we don't eat animals because, as one popular video says, yeah, because I'm not a monster. Um, you know, that's not the, that's a moral judgment. Jesus ate lamb, he ate fish. We know this from scripture. So vegetarianism is not something Jesus subscribed to when he walked the earth. And Paul warns us again and again that judgments concerning what you eat and what you drink may very well reflect the doctrines of humans. Uh, Gnosticism was very wrapped up in telling you what you could and could not eat. And we still see this lingering in the church, the, the whole prohibition of, of wine in some circles, because you might get drunk or someone might think you can get drunk or it might be a bad testimony is not anything to the point in Scripture. Scripture warns very much against those kind of things. Moderation, <laughs> self-control, under the influence of the Spirit, absolutely. But the evil's not in the thing, nor are we, bad, are we closer to God because we suddenly decide that we found the thing that makes us better than other people. So there's our warning, mm -hmm. while at the same time saying, you can enjoy God's creation on your own terms. That's kind of the point. <laughs> Two people could follow the exact same diet, eat the exact same meal, and one of them would be sinning because of how they're approaching it and their mindset, and the other would not. It depends on whether they're approaching it as something, like, you're, like you've been saying, for works righteousness, or if they're trying to be good stewards of their body, for instance, or <laughs> approaching it as a, as a gift from God's grace. Mm -hmm. this, this is possible because, it, like you're saying, it's not in the things itself. It's, right. Right. it's in the attitude. Sin comes from the heart of man, not from the heart of a piece of bread. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. bread's awfully malicious and sneaky. You never know. Mm. Yeah. A friend recently asked me about the origins of graham crackers, which is <laughs> one of my favorite, favorite stories. You want um, to tell it or you want me to? <laughs> I want you to tell it. Uh, well, we're in the... Uh, period before the American Civil War, in the wake of the revivals, if you want to call them that, led by uh, Charles Finney, there, had, there was developing across America a mindset that was entirely romantic, that said that sin is in the environment. If we can clean up the environment, we will get rid of sin and the millennium will arrive. And various people looked for various ways, tried, tried to, to pinpoint what in the environment was was really the cause of so much evil. And a number of, of guys landed on um, red meat in breakfast, steak, bacon, <laughs> things like that. Basically anything good and in, true yeah, in this world. <laughs> pretty much. Uh, and so the solution, the, the, the fear was this, this, this red meat is creating in young men sexual lusts. And it explains those problems that young boys have when they hit puberty. So in order to rescue them from these sinful thoughts, we need to come up with breakfast foods or, or other foods throughout the day that will be effective substitutes. After all, we know it's what goes into a man that defiles him. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, a lot of creative non-exegesis here. This is um, reminding me of a, a sketch by, oh, I just forgot his name, but he's the guy from uh, Black Books who plays Bernard's assistant. Oh, uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. We'll put it in the but show. But we'll notes. come back to it. We have to finish the story. <laughs> well, wow. a couple story. guys came up with it. First of all, not the one Emily was talking about, there was this um, guy in Michigan who came up with a new thing for breakfast. He took corn and ground it into flakes and <laughs> suggested that if you put milk on this, this would be a better breakfast meal than, than bacon and eggs and steak and such. The man's name, of course, he was from Battle Creek, Michigan, was William. Kellogg. He was the Seventh <laughs> Adventist. He had been at Cornflakes. About the same time, there was, um, I think he had a title of doctor of some sort, who was trying to come up with the perfect snack food that, again, would, would take the place of red meats and all that stuff. He wanted to make sure it had all the right ingredients in it, all the right minerals and, and vitamins and such, as they understood that in those days, that, that would make this a complete meal. And he finally came up with it and named it after himself. Dr. Graham called it the Graham Cracker. The Graham, Graham Cracker. <laughs> Yay! And so this, this, and, and, and then, of course, there's uh, 
And there's it, s'mores, which we can be eternally <laughs> grateful for. Yeah, well, there's that. Uh, there's the um, the uh, elder who decided that his church should not be serving wine, and so created oh, something yeah. called grape juice. His man, his name was Welch. Welch. So that whole period in American history, yes, it was optimistic in its eschatology, but oftentimes its soteriology was pagan to the core, as was Charles Finney's. You know, we can control the environment, we can make men good, and then we will usher in the millennium within a very, very short time. So that was a side issue. I don't even remember how we got there. Did you want to oh. dis- did you want to talk about this skit that I don't I'm not familiar with? It oh, is yeah. it's actually a little bit related to what we were talking about. Um, hey. <laughs> I know. What do you know? It's always great when things are actually related. <laughs> I know. Um uh, and it's this great sketch where he's talking about how in the medieval church the tritone was considered satanic and he goes because apparently you know if you heard this music then you would become you know go out and sin and the church didn't want that and so he like it sounded like this and he he plays the tritone on the piano and he goes like hmm i'm inflamed with sexual lust (laughs) (laughs) that is what reminded me was the (laughs) other statement about uh mr mr kellogg and mr graham that's funny because the tritone is actually most commonly recognized as the opening to- opening notes to Maria from West Side Story. Yep. Because <laughs> like people didn't use tritones before then. It's a very 20th century thing to like, mm. we're finally going to. There's Because there's it just sounds terrible. Like that's does. why it's the devil in music. It's because it's not pleasant to listen to. <laughs> I did find some music from the Romantic period. I can't remember what the composers were, but they they had written a mass and they had snuck tritones in as the intervals in like the alto and tenor parts because nobody can hear those parts anyway (laughs) who aren't trained um which i am always bitter about as a tenor Uh, (laughs) i'm singing beautiful things and you can't hear me um but yeah i always found that humorous i was like ah i see what you did there (laughs) those romantics Mm. man Uh, okay did we did we answer our listeners concern do you think i without i think so I yeah, hope so. I hope so. It is not our intention to offend. It is <laughs> our intention to discuss and try to come at things biblically. Um, so we're moving on to our discussion for today, 20 minutes in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> today we're talking about the day the world died, the day of the dead, Semain, and the mythic memory behind both. Greg, what is this all about? Let me read to you from the original original article entitled The Day the World Died. And unfortunately, I just turned the page. Is it by Don that. McLean? No. Oh. October was dying, and darkness fell across the valley, uninterrupted by hearth fire or lamp. A procession of priests, each dressed as one of the great gods, crossed the causeway over the lake and slowly ascended the hill of the star. There, at a shrine sacred to the fire god, the priests took their place about an altar. They readied their sacrifice, a prince or captain of high standing. Then the priests turned their eyes heavenward and fastened them on the slowly climbing Pleiades. As those stars reached their midnight culmination, the priests turned to their sacrificial victim, tore his heart from his chest, and offered it to their god. Then... Within the victim's chest, one priest placed a fireboard. Into it, he shoved a stick, a fire drill, that he spun back and forth between his palms. When its first sparks burst into a steady flame, the priest took the fire and set alight an enormous bonfire, one visible across the valley for miles. Into that bonfire, the priest threw the victim's body. Then relay runners carried a flaming torch to the central temple to light its fires. And from there, the fire was carried to other temples and finally to people's homes. The rite ended when the priests bound together 52 sticks, each representing a year, and buried them with ceremony. The midnight ritual was Aztec, though it likely predates their civilization. Its goal was to stave off the end of the world. If the ceremony failed, the star demons would descend upon the earth and devour mankind. Aztec myth uh, allocated to history five suns or eons. Each began as a god sacrificed himself to set a new sun ablaze. Each ended in cosmic catastrophe, wind, fire, or flood. 
The fifth son, ours, was to perish in a great shaking. Until, the, until then, the sun, the age, the cosmos, time itself, survived on blood, on human sacrifice. After all, it had begun in the God's own sacrifice. But the crucial sacrifice came at a moment carefully worked out on the Aztec calendar. They were convinced that this was necessary because all this destruction of the cosmos had happened once before. The world had died in a day in a great flood that they remembered very, very clearly. As we look across the ancient world, there are countless memories of some great flood that came and washed everything away. There are also very many uh, celebrations of death, of a time when the world died. And as I've tried to look back through some of the, the Victorian texts that researched in this, and it's, it's hard because they tend to quote one another in cycles. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know who wrote first when you keep seeing the same phrase appear in three yeah. or four different authors. And, and as they were working, they were working with an imperfect understanding, which I think is where we still are, of the various calendars, of overlapping calendars, of holidays, that's holy days that started in one month and then got moved by divine decree or royal decree to some other month. So it's hard to, to sort out the details, and there's, there's room here for us simply to be wrong about some things. But this, this Aztec ceremony uh, does not seem to be unique in setting this this celebration of death, this attempt to hold back death at the culmination of the Pleiades, the end of October, the beginning of November. And the point I would like to make here is that's awfully strange. Mm -hmm. You know, the ancients watched the skies. They were not strangers to them. Unlike those of us who live in cities who barely can see the stars, they lived beneath a night sky that was that had more stars than we ever see, by and large. And they knew when the planets and the moon came and went, and how the sun rose, and how it moved along the right. They, they were very familiar with all these things. And the priests tended to be experts in these things. So the culmination of Pleiades, okay, they, they could figure out when that was going to happen. Well, why that? Why not the equinox or the solstice? Neither, In fact, it, it's almost in between the two. Wouldn't it be easier to pick one of those? Why did? What were they remembering? Or why were they latching on to this particular date? And as, as we rummage through the, the festivals of the ancient world, and again, sometimes we can't always be sure when they were sad, what calendar they were on, but there does seem to be a pattern that an awful lot of them occurred more or less around that time. Or at least, depending on where you're starting your calendar, a couple months in from the beginning of the year. And this, these are all specifically festivals associated with a cataclysmic event cataclysmic of death. event, um, the death Because, like, obviously there are other festivals that are on equinox and... Yes, uh, there, there, are, there are a lot yeah. of festivals that are set on equinox mm -hmm. or the, uh, the solstice, but this is something different. It may be the death of a large amount of people. It may be remembered as a day of the dead, a uh, day of ghosts, a uh, uh, day that a god died. It, it varies. But this idea of remembering death is fairly prevalent. And even if only a few of them in the long one could be ironed out to be, uh, we can nail it down that this was sometime late in October, early November, that's still an odd thing. And the, the thing they keep coming back to is the, is the, uh, the Pleiades culminated. And the uh, anthropologists who have looked at this have said, well, that's about the beginning of such and such a thing with begin to cross, but that's a weird marker. But there is something in scripture that does suggest exactly why it might be then. And again, I'm going to turn to the book of Genesis and read from chapter 7. These are verses 11, 12, and 21. In the 600 year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and all flesh died. The original calendar for Israel, for the ancient world, began with the autumnal equinox, sometime around September 22nd, September 23rd. And again, there's been a drift of, of calendar months and so over the centuries. But that's a pretty clear objective thing. That's when the world started, and as you the, the Jewish festival of uh, Rosh Hashanah, 
trumpets. New Year's Day is still a memory of that. Later on in uh, Israel's history, God would reset their calendar, shifting everything by seven months, and make uh, Abib or Nisan the first day, the day, uh, first uh, month of the year, the month when Israel came out of Egypt, the Passover and the Exodus. But the civil calendar still re retained September ish, at the end of September, as the beginning of the calendar, the first month. And if you count from there the distance that Scripture give us, gives us, the second month, the 17th day of the month, you're getting awfully close to the time that the Western Church remembers as All Souls Day, when we remember all of the souls that have died and as opposed to the, well, actually, it's All Saints Day, all of us, it's Souls Day. The one celebrating, All Saints Day, celebrating those who have gone, died and gone directly to heaven and All Souls Days. Everybody else who needs prayer because they're in purgatory. Coincidence? Maybe not. The Bible is telling us that there was a historic event when God brought judgment upon the entire planet to a degree that that civilization we were talking about, that advanced civilization that probably possessed electricity and the ability to build things and move things in ways that we don't remember anymore, all of that, a world-spanning civilization, was washed away in a day. And what survived, survived in the ark with Noah and his family in the hearts and minds of those eight people and in the books that Noah would have brought with him. And that's what we're going to talk about next time, how to build a civilization, but based on books. And uh, that's something we're all good at. So we'll enjoy that <laughs> a lot. Yeah. But the point for, for this uh, discussion is this. Why don't we want to remember the flood? Well, we don't want to remember. This one's easy. This is why this can be a short one. Because <laughs> the flood points to a person of God who rules history, who does not so much intervene in history as blow the whistle and say, we're done here. And brings his judgments because he's not a god afar off. He's not God's providence is not something where God peeks in now and then and does gee nifties. It's God's constant covenantal governance of creation. And sometimes he goes beyond his normal order, what we call providence, and does the things we call miracles. Flood was miraculous. To what degree those miracles made use of natural processes, it's hard to say at this point. There's a danger of trying to press too hard into things that God hasn't told us. Certainly there were waters trapped deep within the earth that he released. And water tends to drown people. That's a purely natural <laughs> kind of thing. But the timing and, and the way it happened and the reasons it happened were in God's hands. Now, nobody who hates God wants to admit that. And we are familiar with the passage in Second uh, Peter that says this. And he, he, he's... Um, Peter's talking about people primarily in his own day, but it certainly has applications to today. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, in the last days for the apostles were the days leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heaven and the earth, which are now by the same God, are kept in store reserved unto fire, unto the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Peter saying that even in his days there were people who were saying, oh, history goes on, it continues, nothing, nothing odd ever really happens. God never intervenes in any noticeable way. And Peter's saying, remember the flood? No, you don't. <laughs> you don't because you don't want to remember. Because you remembering that means that history is not meaningless and it means you are accountable. And the flood in Noah's day points to the great judgment at the end of history, which is most certainly coming. And that scares people no end. And we can see that even in the Aztec, the illustration that you brought up earlier, they have this recollection of the day that they have to forestall by employing human sacrifice. And even for them, it's, it's nature. We go through these rites because the calendar is the objective reality. And that's just the way of the world. That's the way things are. They've even pushed off this idea of God's personal judgment of there's a God that we need to be at peace with. 
Yeah, the, all of the, the religions of the ancient world were both pantheistic and polytheistic. Uh, God, divine substance, is inherent in all of reality. It's just a question of it being focused in certain personalities that may or may not be sentient individuals, depending on which poet or legend you listen to. Are these mm -hmm. personifications that we make so we can understand it, or, or does the universe take on particular identities for a time before it, it passes that that life force passes back into the substance that's everything. So as they they can look at this and they can name the gods, but yes, at the same time it's a wholly natural because wholly supernatural kind of process. They don't make the distinction between natural and supernatural. All is one. Once where we started our discussions at the beginning of all this and why it's so important. Once you deny the creator creation distinction, you don't get rid of God. You deify everything. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, it becomes you're you're left with magic. The uh, macrocosm is the microcosm, and the microcosm is the macrocosm. Find the right wheel here, turn it, and you change the universe, which is exactly what the Aztecs were trying to do, mm -hmm. and it's a common theme throughout. Well, after the Enlightenment, we didn't want to think religiously anymore, <laughs> but we wanted still wanted to get rid of the flood, and, and in order to introduce an alternative to biblical creationism. There was a rather famous scientist, and, and most people, I don't know if anybody knows him today, who don't, aren't actually active in geology. His name was uh, Sir Charles Lyell, or Lyell, 1797-1875. Uh, he wrote a book, a three-volume book, called Principles of Geology. He was the first to say, now, you know, guys, we've always believed in uh, this catastrophic flood and such. Uh, and that, that laid down all the sediments we see. But but consider this. What if those sediments were laid down over thousands, yea, millions of years by constant processes that we can still observe today? And would that would account for exactly what we see and would explain these fossils and things we find in them. The, the older strata represent things that were millions of years old and the things trapped there are things that lived back then. And the more recent strata, of course, are things closer to our own time, and so on. Interestingly enough, the one thing Lyle ever did was to say, and this thoroughly contradicts Genesis. He stayed away from Genesis. He was smart. He knew, and he, he, we have notes from him on this, Darwin talking about this. He did not want to confront creationism and, and the idea of Noah's flood directly. He just wanted to offer an alternative without raising any kind of red flag so that people would follow along, oh, this is science. <coughs> and begin to buy into it without thinking through, oh, wait, this means I have to throw out Genesis. And so he did the spade work for Darwin, when, and Darwin was actually one of his disciples. When Darwin came along, the, the whole idea of evolutionary geology was already in place, and he just had to seed into it the doctrine of the uh, descent of man from, from lower life forms. So this was a very calculated approach to replacing biblical catastrophism with what we've called uniformitarianism. Now, the ironic thing in our generation is after two centuries of our, well, not even that, century and a half of arguing, no, all natural rates continue at the same processes indefinitely, no catastrophes allowed in our generations, except for huge asteroids striking the planet and destroying all the dinosaurs, <laughs> except for global warming and global cooling. We've got to oh, the place yeah. now where we can admit catastrophes, but they are accidental. Divine providence isn't allowed. Divine judgment is not allowed. The asteroids that wiped out the dinosaurs were just their bad luck. It has nothing at all to do with any kind of plan of God. And global warming, cooling, climate change, whatever we're calling it. A hundred years ago, that would never have flown with any great success. Although some of the attempts go back almost that far mm -hmm. to, to come to inculcate that doctrine. But it, it, didn't, it didn't gain traction because there was still this idea that natural processes, all things continue as they are since the beginning of creation, as Peter says. Because if we do that, then no global flood, and far more to the point, no second coming, resurrection, a final judgment. And as a, a tag note on all this, I find it interesting, amusing, that the only place in our culture where you find references to Noah's flood anymore is in baby nurseries. Mm, the toys, the toys, the yeah. blankets, the mobiles, um, the um, 
whatever you call the things you hang on walls, tapestries or whatever they're <laughs> called, are full of these things. And of course, they always have the the boat with the little boxy thing and the giraffes sticking their it's heads out. It's always the, the giraffes. It's always yeah. the giraffes, yeah. <laughs> um, I've come to inspect the tapestries. <laughs> the tapestries. Uh, what, what, what is it when science sweeps it one way and everyday life sweeps it into children's nurseries where it becomes what? Do we cute. Do, cute. <laughs> Yeah. Don't we? Even if we didn't believe it, if we thought it was all a myth, it's a myth that describes the death of millions, if not billions, of people in a single day. Why are we hanging this in children's rooms? <laughs> it's, it's, it, we yeah. were talking earlier about ways of of dealing with guilt or our sense of guilt, of uh, mechanisms for avoiding God, and I think this is one grand one. Let's stuff it all in the nursery and reduce these animals to cute little playthings for children. On the and level of the Easter bunny the and level, the tooth fairy. Exactly. Because to think about what they, even to think for a moment of what they really represent is too horrifying. And we can't deal with that. The ancient world dealt with it with religious festivals and human sacrifice. Uh, the Enlightenment dealt with it in reinventing all of geological history to get away from it. But hey, we just uh, put it in children's nurseries and call it cute. But what's interesting is uh, you can see something in a similar vein when you when you look at films that are are made for children versus films that are you know made for uh, educated adults, art films and the like. Is art films are, with very rare exceptions, imminently unenjoyable. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. They're this art a, because they're not fun, which is a dumb definition of art. And uh, they, they, the the ones that get more lauded are the ones that don't have a plot, an arc, characters, development of those characters, etc. I mean, that you you'll have popular level movies that will have those elements, but increasingly, children's movies are the one holdout because mm-hmm. children aren't. They have not convinced themselves that. Movies have to be serious and not fun mm-hmm. to yeah. be something worth watching, and likewise for just stories in general. So you you end up children movies have the more resonant themes, yes, mm-hmm. and the more meaningful character actions. And I'm not complaining about that. I'm glad that there's something <laughs> still with that, but that is, is a little backwards. Mm-hmm. And it's the exact yeah. same thing. It is the acknowledgement of truth in a nursery wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how much this is so, but Tolkien argued that there was more of the gospel in some of the old fairy tales. The prince whose love awakes the sleeping beauty, the, the prince who fights a dragon to rescue the princess, the, the prince who rescues the the young lady who has eaten of the poison apple (laughs) um there's more there's more gospel there than there is in a lot of i don't remember what he said modern stories preaching i don't know you could go for both and win yeah Um, (laughs) and and lewis pointed out that uh fairy tales tended to gravitate toward the nursery room not because they were originally designed for children they were originally designed for adults and thus the blood and gore of Right. The Grim <laughs> stories. Um, Got to get that German nationalism in yeah, there. But, but intelligent, enlightened people could not bring themselves to read such things. And so they pushed them off mm-hmm. on their kids and then watered them down and down and down. And as Disney continues to do. So that mm-hmm. there, there's hardly a trace of semblance anymore. There's also, I believe it's another quote by Lewis where he, I don't remember the context offhand, but. Essentially, he was writing to someone else and and told them, I, I hope that one day you shall be old enough for fairy stories again. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think that's his introduction to uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Writing to that's Lucy, right. Yes. Lucy Barfield. I hope that what well, actually so. takes so long in the writing that uh, you won't appreciate this now, but I hope one day you're old enough to when you're grown up and I can't, <laughs> I can't understand you or hear you anymore that you can pull this down and still enjoy it. That's what yeah, it was. Because, yeah, our, our, we don't like funny stories, fun stories, interesting stories, likable characters. Oh, what well, likable characters. Oh boy. <laughs> Superman. That's a Mary Sue. <laughs> Superman. 
Yeah. Oh, why? Yeah. Why can't DC get their movies off the ground? Because Batman and Superman, they're two prime candidates who, who used to dominate TVs and movies. They've turned them into thoroughly unlikable, existentially angsty characters that nobody would want to hang out with. Yeah. We all we all yeah. love to spend the day with Steve Rogers or Natasha Romanoff or Tony Stark. Or yeah, Peter we, Quill. Or <laughs> no, maybe not. Or, um, <laughs> or But he has uh, the best jam. Yeah, or Peter uh, Peter Parker apparently is the thing with the new kids. Mm-hmm. Younger kids. They're they're likable characters. But they're not serious characters. And DC <laughs> hasn't figured out. People want to go see superhero movies. Superhero. There's a reason. It's not just because these people can do incredible, fantastic things. It was because they were heroes. They mm-hmm. laid down their lives to do what other people could not do, as Nick Fury has told us. Mm. With great power becomes comes great responsibility. These are people who were given great powers and therefore have taken upon themselves great responsibility. But the last Superman movie, Justice League, Superman spends the whole time angstly deciding why I have these powers and what I'm supposed to do with them, if I understand correctly. Yeah, the whole <laughs> we're, we're we're spoiling everything. This this existential nihilistic attitude toward history and heroes and story is sapping all the life out of them. And so we adorn them with sex and violence. To appeal to man's baser nature, and yet, yeah, a lot of small children still tell me a story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and Superman specifically. Um, hopefully, DC doesn't hit us with a copyright for mentioning him. Um, <laughs> the, the we'll bleep it out. Maybe <laughs> people will have to figure Superman it out. And Batman the man are in trademarks spandex. of DC <laughs> yeah. comics. Sorry. We're talking about <laughs> Stupendous Man and uh, the um, I don't know Tab Man. This Tab Man, <laughs> uh, but with, with Superman man. specifically, the entire problem that I have with the newer movies with him is that they've like I think Snyder has specifically admitted this. He's trying to deconstruct the character, mm-hmm. yeah, and that's a problem in <laughs> any case. But especially with Superman because Superman's kind of a simplistic character yeah oh, he's, absolutely. he's not he's that literally complex. just there's not much to take the a bite. guy who bullets can't kill <laughs> yeah who yeah. loves america and his mom and apple pie and they Truth basically gotten economy. rid of all of that except for his mom basically yeah and now he's an alien an immigrant from another world but whose dad was like, you should just let the kids die instead of saving them. Like, uh, <laughs> Papa Kent would never have said that no, in no, any <laughs> universe before <laughs> Snyder got his fingerprints all over it. Anyway. All right. Moving from moving things forward. we intensely dislike <laughs> <laughs> to things that we like. Yes. Uh, let's let's talk about some recommendations. <laughs> what have we been enjoying this week? Well, I have t- I have two recommendations. Okay. In, keep, in keeping with the sober, somber tone of this whole discussion and our deep theological roots, I want to recommend Herman Bovink's The Doctrine of God. It's part <laughs> of his larger systematics, but as far as I can see, it's by far the best section. It is challenging at points, but those are generally points you can skip over when he starts talking about hey. how all the heretics screwed up this doctrine. <laughs> you don't want to read about them. You generally can skip along until he gets to, but the Bible says. Mm. Uh, but it My is, boy Bavink. Yeah, it is both the, uh, the freshest and deepest discussion of who God is that I have read. And this is also, for those of us who know Cornelius Van Til, this, this is the theology that, that Van Til read and assumed in his writings. It is eminently worth your time. And even if, if some of it's a little heady, there's plenty there just to, to grab a paragraph or two and chew on for a long time. Mm. So that that's what I originally was going to recommend. But occasionally I read fun stuff, <laughs> if you can call this fun. I, I'm, I'm writing a novel that's set in the uh, late 50s and, and, and 60s and 70s. It's kind of anyway. It will probably never see the light of day. But Are you really, Russian? This sounds long. <laughs> <laughs> but as I was coming up and writing a particular scene, I thought, I need to refresh my memory on the 60s, even though I lived through it. But I lived through it as a child, so a lot of it 
I honestly learned about the 60s from watching television. The way not to learn history. <laughs> um, so I, I came across uh, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the 60s. Mm. And it is a fun book. It's easily written. It's, it's not all that deep. But time and again, I've run into things that I did not know. The, the list of who were, for instance, who were the most respected actors and actresses. 1960s. Who, was the, who, who would everybody say, he's the box office star that's going to draw all the attention? 1960s. Who do you think? 1960s. You're too young. You may not know. Steve McQueen? Nope. Back further. Maybe later. Back, Back further. further. Jimmy Cary Stewart Grant. was too... That's no. too far. Too far. Too far. No, 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 yeah. no. No? You're not too right, far? You're in the right range, but... I was. Think solid American. I was thinking American. trade. Think Wild West. John Wayne. John Wayne. Oh, duh. duh. Now, now I feel the dumb. actress who starred in three of the leading... Well... Two of the leading musicals and and did another one on Broadway stage. You know, Emily, who is this? Yeah, Julie Andrews. Julie my Andrews hero. was the lead <laughs> box office draw among women back in the radical 60s. Uh, when we start looking at the songs that went platinum, there was there were the Beatles, for one. But there were a ton of other people that this generation doesn't even remember and some of them, again, were musicals, like Sound of Music. So that's just a couple quick peeps of things that we have been told that aren't true about the 60s. The 60s were actually, by and large, a rather conservative decade. It's just that the people who watched the trends set the trends and told us what the trends obviously were, were themselves very radical. Mm-hmm. And they rewrote history for us, as we, and then they reinterpreted it on television so that now when we think of the 60s, we remember it as television portrays it. But we also skip to the end of the decade, right? With the summer of 69, like yeah. that's supposed to encapsulate the entire yeah, decade we, before we, it. Yeah, we worked up to that. And it was a flash in the pan. Uh, the Altamont Festival, after, after Woodstock, the Altamont Festival mm-hmm. in California in 1970, pretty much ended all of that rather quickly. But of course, having let loose the acids of relativism, uh, particularly in the universities, because a lot of these 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 kids who were the radical the, who were the radical leaders went on to get jobs at universities because they stayed in university to avoid the draft, and they decided to just keep on staying there and get uh, professorships and get tenured, and now they're the ones teaching us or our children or grandchildren. Or so. they <laughs> stuck around in seminary because the sem- the churches. Yeah. Uh, Allowed them to get out as conscientious objectors. Yes, yes, just like the the uh, seminary. And they had low that. enough standards that they let them just. Oh, and there's get there's ordained. another there's another thing that, that the, the author by the way the author's name is Jonathan Leaf. He mentions the the dumbing down of curriculum across the board, so that people who were not great students to begin with could still get by with a C if you set your standards low enough, so these people could continue to get their draft deferments. And mm. stay away from where the ordinary guy next door went, Vietnam. So anyway, I enjoyed it greatly. The, the whole section on rock music was, um, I thought, on the whole, pretty balanced. He's not one of these guys who says all rock is evil, although he comes close at times. <laughs> but more more for what it does musically than for out of any intense Christian moralism. Mm. Uh, he basically just says it's shallow music and, and mm. explains why he says that. Um, well, with some interesting disagree, quotes. but okay. <laughs> with some interesting <laughs> quotes from people who ought to know music who say much the same thing. He, he allows that there are some, some brilliant pieces by uh, Paul McCartney and some other people during that. Oh, his section on uh, Bob Dylan. Mm-hmm. The question he raises is, why is Bob Dylan famous? What, 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 what exactly did he do that, was, that he did any good at? Was it his singing voice? Was it his ability to play an instrument? Was, and he goes down the list like, he could play a harmonica. I don't know if I would enjoy this book. Right? I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be could, honest. I could just see Emily becoming more and more yeah. agitated at the list of things. <laughs> Not okay. Well, I will stop there so I don't agitate too much. So, Emily, what's your pick for this week? My recommendation is the website and podcast. This is going to sound funny because I'm a girl, but The Art of Manliness. Oh, yeah. I really love their podcast. Their website is you know interdisciplinary it's like all these sorts of things that is about being manly but like turns out they're 
a lot of them are just good for being a competent person. <laughs> so I like them too. Uh, but their podcast, they do actually interview a lot of women as well as men, but the, it's often an author. Um, and one recent podcast was with, uh, what is his name? Alan Jacobs, uh, who's a lit professor. Um, and he wrote a book lit. on lit. Yeah. <laughs> did, did I hear that joke? That's, that's so 2018, Brian. <laughs> oh my word. I'm behind the times. I'm an old soul. Yeah. So the name of the book is The Pleasures of Reading in an Age of Distraction. Mm. And his argument in the book is essentially not to take a list of great books and books you think you ought to read and read them. It's like, that is a great way to sap all of the joy from reading, <laughs> which is something that I've found in the last few years, you know, since college, I've just been so burnt out on reading. It's like, how did I used to like this? <laughs> well, this used to be fun. I used to get up early just so I could read. What's that like? And so he argues, you should read what you enjoy reading and find your author's favorite authors and read them sort of swim upstream. Like you were mentioning with Van Til and Bavink, like if you like mm -hmm. Van Til, read Bavink, right. because that's who influenced Van Til. So he argues that we should do that. We should follow what we actually enjoy reading. And then as we swim upstream, we'll get to the good books. But to really enjoy and get a lot out of reading, you should read what you like, which was encouraging to me because I recently read Dante and I respect him, but I didn't really enjoy it. <laughs> Well, my daughter, Emily, would take issues with you on that because for her, <laughs> the whole universe is about Dante, particularly the Inferno. She's <laughs> learned Latin and Italian in part so she can read the Inferno in its original language. Good luck. She's a, yeah, she's a medieval studies major at uh, the University of, I don't know how many students, 30,000, I don't know. And there are only three medieval studies majors on <laughs> campus. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Either that means she's going to do very well in life or that she's unemployable. We'll see. <laughs> As for her. Well, she's female, so that's going for her that's in academia going, right now. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. Brian, what do you got? All right. I um, am breaking my normal trend of recommending music by switching to recommending books. These Ooh. were two. One I read last year and one I read actually the year previous. Uh, the first one is by Stephen R. Lawhead, and it ah. is mm. called The Pendragon Cycle. For, yes. So you oh, can that see brings, it. That brings back memories. Uh, this and is classic. It is marvelous. I've only read the first book, and I've, I've just started, I think the second book is called Merlin, mm. and it is phenomenal. Uh, for, the, for the listeners who are not familiar, and David, um, <laughs> it is about where King Arthur and Merlin come from. And it is set in real mythic English history. There is it, Atlantis Wait, yeah. is involved for a good chunk of this book. And they're sort of the basis for the she, the, the, the fae and the legends regarding them. So that is my fiction recommendation. This is one. It's interesting. You brought up the art of manliness because this is a book by Reverend Richard, Richard D. Phillips, who I believe is a minister in the PCA, but he might be OPC. I've forgotten offhand. It is called the masculine mandate. Ah. And it is a phenomenal little tome. It's not that long. Probably took me about a week or two. It's like 200 pages fantastic very balanced it avoids both the pitfall of uber macho being a christian man is about cutting down trees and having a beard and drinking whiskey and the other <laughs> side of um uh, essentially christianized effeminacy very mm. very good very balanced those are my two recommendations excellent thank cool. you thanks you got it. So that concludes our show for the day. Uh, you can check out our show notes and transcripts on our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or on whatever podcast catcher you're getting us. We have special thanks to our very first financial supporter. We haven't really talked about the fact that you can support us financially. So this uh, very kind and generous lady reached out to us and asked, how can I give you money? And we were just so blown away and surprised and thankful. So if you, like this very kind and generous lady, would like to give us money, you can do so 
via our website. That's anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Once again, uh, they support monthly gifts. So it's like, how much would you like to give a month? That sort of thing. Uh, if you'd prefer to do a one time support, you can do that through our PayPal, which is paypal.me slash halting towards Zion. Uh, you can send us an email at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. You can like us on Facebook. And everybody should get on Goodreads because it's the best social media. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can leave us a review if you're listening on iTunes or some other podcast catcher that supports leaving us reviews. If you like us, give us five stars. If you don't like us, you don't need to give us a review. That's okay. <laughs> um, but thanks for listening anyway. See you next time. <laughs>